thing night in the US, <laughs> lunchtime in Norway, on uh, making climate policy work. Um, today is a historical day. It's the day that the US leaves the Paris Agreement. And there's also this one matter of an election going on in the US. So luckily for us, we have two American researchers with us um, to give us some fresh and possibly also controversial ideas on how to make climate policy work. Uh, with a focus on domestic policy, I should add. So David Victor is a professor at UC uh, in California, San Diego. And Danny Collinwood is a lecturer in law at Stanford University. And we're going to give a presentation based on their new book, Making Climate Policy Work. We will do questions and answers after their presentation. And because we have quite a big crowd, more than 100, pe more than 100 people signed up for this webinar, we'll do them in writing. So at the bottom center of your screen, there's a button called Q&A. So if you want to ask questions, just type your questions into that Q&A uh, box, and then we'll get to those uh, after their presentation. So uh, Dan and David, you're on. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Um, good morning from San Diego. I'm not sure it's a good morning. Apologies to the rest of the planet for what our electoral system is doing once again. Um, we're really pleased to be here, Stefan. You and I worked together for many years, and I've worked with Cicero for a long time, many collaborators and friends in Norway. Um, I see some very familiar names on the attendee list. And uh, so it's, it's our pleasure to, to talk with you today about a book that came out just about 10 days ago from Polity called Making Climate Policy Work. Um, and Danny and I are going to give an overview of the book over the next 20, 25 minutes and then open it up for, for discussion um, uh, that, that Stefan is gonna moderate. So there, there are a lot of reasons why the world is not doing enough to address the climate crisis. Uh, one of them is playing out right now in the US electoral system. And what we're um, exploring in this book is the hypothesis that one of the reasons that we haven't done more is we haven't been thinking about the politics of the choice of policy instruments in the correct way that we've been overly enthusiastic uh, under the wrong circumstances about market-based instruments, cap and trade and tax systems, not that they don't have a role to play, but that without thinking about the politics of how these instruments are created and implemented, um, that we're unwittingly uh, under, uh, under providing uh, emission control efforts uh, because we're, we're choosing instruments whose politics are particularly difficult to manage and sustain. So this is not a pro-market book or an anti-market book. It's just a clinical book. It's a look um, uh, at how carbon pricing has worked. Uh, and you know, while we're still gathering a lot of data, we've had two decades or so of experience in this domain. And so there's quite a lot of data with which to test some theories and advance some theories. And that's what we're trying to do uh, in, this, uh, in this book. So what's the puzzle that we're trying to explain? Let me go to the next slide. So on the left-hand side, you see data, very familiar data from the World Bank showing the, the share of global greenhouse gas emissions over time that are subjected to various kinds of carbon pricing initiatives, carbon taxes and cap and trade or emission trading, uh, emission trading scheme. And from that perspective, uh, it's a very encouraging looking picture. Now a quarter of global emissions are subjected to, to market-based systems. We have a nascent Chinese system that's emerging uh, uh, very rapidly. Um, and it looks like basically carbon pricing and market instruments are taking over the world and becoming the dominant policy instrument. And to the extent that one believes that, then you really focus on how do we design those properly and, and how do we get other kinds of policy instruments out of the way where they're interfering and let the markets actually function. The right-hand side of this picture shows the same, almost the same data, but organized in a different way, organized by, by price level. Um, and so if you look at the very bottom, and the, um, uh, the, the horizontal axis is the fraction of, uh, uh, of emissions under different price level regimes. Um, the bottom, essentially all the world emissions are uh, at a price to level of zero. Above that, we have emissions that come out of um, and systems like the California system, very low prices. California's bouncing around uh, right now, but kind of in the $15, $16 range. Then above that, you have emissions from the uh, uh, EU ETS. And then above that, you have much higher tax regimes, including what you have in Norway. So there are a few places, uh, Norway among them, Switzerland, a couple others, that have very, very high tax levels. But the overall story is the price levels are, are uh, extremely low. 
that doesn't mean that jurisdictions aren't doing anything. Uh, but prices are interesting because they reveal effort. They're one way to start to look at the uh, to look at the effort. And if you look behind the curtain here, in in say California, where prices are relatively low, fifteen sixteen dollars a ton. In fact, there are all kinds of other policies that are doing a lot of work at ten times the level of actual effort. And, and in a little bit, Danny's going to show you some data on. Uh, on, on that. Or you look at the opposite extreme, Norway, for example, where you have high carbon prices, at least high car nominal carbon prices. And then you have a, all kinds of additional projects that are really interesting, like Equinor's uh, Northern Lights project, which does uh, final investment decision in the middle of the global pandemic and can't be justified on the carbon price alone, but can be justified with all kinds of additional policy support and collaboration with other big uh, gas and oil companies and uh, 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 joint support between the Nor Norwegian government and the, uh, and the EU, uh, EU governments. So that's what we observe in the real world is this kind of interesting puzzle that, that even the, the pioneers that are doing quite a lot on, on climate change, what they're doing is far beyond uh, what's being revealed by their, uh, uh, by, their, by, their, by their price levels. And as Danny and I wrote this book, we began to wonder, you know, is the problem that the pioneers who are already willing to do a lot, do they just not understand the beauty of markets? You know, were, were their political leaders asleep in Economics 101 when they learned about externalities? And uh, you know, had they only been awake and learned more about this, and we as analysts had said more about this and so on, that they would be using market instruments to an even greater degree to have kind of optimal, economically efficient um, uh, uh, investments in, in carbon reduction efforts. So that's kind of what we were puzzling and through in the book. What the book does that's new, one of the things that the book that does that's new is it offers, um, it looks at the history of essentially all significant market-based systems uh, for climate change through the lens of a very simple model of politics, a very simple political economy model. And so the next slide will show you kind of key moving parts in this model. I don't want to belabor it here. We can talk more about this in the Q&A period. For those of you who study uh, political behavior and political economy, this will be completely familiar. So we have five actors, uh, think of them as interest groups in our model, um, of which three of them do most of the work, the ones that are that are in the asterisk. We have broad-based interests, the voters and the general public. Uh, they're interesting because they're often not very well organized, but they are very sensitive to prices in some sectors, and particular transportation fuels. And so, uh, you see quite often in, in sectors that are that are consumer facing. Uh, uh, enormous political difficulties in raising prices in those sectors, even though in other sectors where people are, where voters are, 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 are less aware of uh, price impacts of policy instruments, there's much less, uh, much less sensitive, uh, sensitivity. We rewrote just a kind of footnote to wonk out for a moment. We wrote this theory of politics in a way that, although we're talking about voters here, I think the logic of this polit political model works just as well when you're thinking about a logic of political survival and they aren't voters, but there are other constituents that are they're supporting an authoritarian government. Uh, emitting industries play a big role. Emitting industries are incumbents. They, they know how they could be harmed by uh, policy instruments and they are very well organized to try and block that harm. Uh, we talk a bit about emerging low carbon industries. It turns out emerging low carbon industries, you know, renewable industries and so on, they don't look to carbon markets as the main instrument for getting things done. They look to other policy instruments. We have organized civil, civil society, think NGOs, and then we have political leaders, you know, entrepreneurs, people with ideas. Um, so we've got these five actors in this model. Uh, we've got two institutional rules that um, think of these as the rules of the road that explain how these actors interact with each other and how ultimately decisions get made. Two that are very important. One, obviously, are the rules that affect how policies are adopted. If you're in a political system where the, where the rule is consensus, then not surprisingly, veto players play a, a, an outsized role. Uh, think of international treaty making, where essentially you've got consensus decision making. So it's not surprising that veto players are extremely uh, important. But there's a lot of variation in constitutional systems uh, across different jurisdictions. Uh, uh, cap and trade systems are often easier to adopt because they're considered environmental measures, whereas uh, tax measures uh, in many countries are harder to adopt because they're fiscal measures. And so there are higher bur uh, hurdles to be cleared for adopting fiscal measures. And then administrative capacity. Um, there's been a lot of talk about administrative capacity um, uh, 
in the in the literature. Most of it focused on a fairly technical, important set of questions about do you know where the emissions are coming and can you manage trading and, and offset rules and, and on and on and on. And while that plays a role, in our mind, a much bigger role for administrative capacity is the capacity to compensate powerful interest groups that are harmed. Um, so if emitting industries are worried about the harm, if they can go to government and get some compensating uh, uh, policy, for example, electric companies who might have to pay higher carbon taxes, but if they can adjust tariffs and reliably pass those on to consumers, then they're going to be less opposed to policy instruments than in the case where the government has essentially no capacity to keep organized interest groups whole or to, or to set them aside. So that's a, a big element of administrative capacity. So. That's to give you just a flavor of the model that we have at work um, through which we are then interpreting the whole history of cap and trade and carbon tax systems uh, and leading to, I think, some different results from the, the standard view. So what I wanna do is I wanna look at one dimension of this, uh, one interpretation or reinterpretation of this history that we, that we do in the book, and then I'm gonna get the floor over, uh, over, over to Dan. So next slide, please. So this slide um, shows the difference between the nominal price of, um, uh, of uh, emissions in different jurisdictions around the world and the actual average price. So if you go to legislation or you go to the regulatory system or go to the markets and look at where, where is a ton of carbon trading, uh, that's the marginal, that's the, the nominal price. Um, and some places, Sweden is a very high no, uh, nominal price, Norway, high nominal price. Others much lower. You can go to the California uh, cap and trade auctions, quarterly auctions, and figure out what the nominal price is for a ton of carbon in the, in the California system. And that's the, the the dotted line along the uh, along the forty five degree uh, um, uh, angle here. There's a this, this data is drawn from this terrific study that Jeffrey Dolphin and colleagues at Cambridge University did. Um, uh, Dolphin is now, I think, at the Resources for the Future, where they went and looked sector by sector at the actual price in every sector um, in every country. And that then shows this lower line, which is the economy-wide average price. So why is there a difference between the nominal price of carbon and the average price of carbon? The reason there's a difference is because some sectors are excluded altogether. Some of that is for administrative reasons, but often that is because uh, the sector is, for example, uh, trade exposed. And if you're making steel and you're competing with commodity steel and other parts of the world and, and the global steel market, uh, even if your country wants to do a whole lot uh, around reducing emissions from steel, you can't yourself compete in this global market. And so you need an exemption from the carbon price or some other kind of compensation in order to, uh, uh, in order to survive. And that's what we're seeing uh, in, this, uh, in, in, this, in this chart. So one of the implications of this is we have to be, as analysts, very careful to look at the actual incidence of carbon prices as opposed to the nominal prices. If you're thinking about, for example, designing border, uh, border, carbon, uh, border carbon adjustments. One of the other implications from this is that the politics are gonna be different in every single sector. And so if you do what the kind of standard logic, standard wisdom of designing good carbon markets is, which is to link all different sectors together and have them have one price rule them all for you Lord of the Rings fans. Uh, and if you link them all together, ironically, you actually make it politically harder to create an effective market-based system because the politics of, of that, all of those different link sectors become tethered to the, the ambition of the lowest uh, common denominator. Uh, we see this in California, for example, um, where uh, the political sensitivity to anything that raises uh, prices on transportation fuels is very high. And so we in California have been very thrilled with ourselves that our transportation sector is linked to other industrial sectors in a cap and trade system. But the very act of linking all those sectors together has in effect guaranteed that the California system, uh, although it talks a good game, the California system in effect is stuck at price levels that reflect what's politically feasible in the least ambitious sector uh, of, the, of the whole system, which is, um, which is transportation. That doesn't mean that we aren't doing something about transportation and emissions in California. In the news recently about new regulatory actions on electric vehicles. Uh, you look in the markets, the, the actual cost of a lot of transportation measures are uh, 10 times the level of the uh, prevailing price in the cap and trade system. But, the, but what we're doing in the transportation sector that has the biggest impact is regulatory. And this explains one of the 
I think maybe most important extensions of the, of the logic that we're laying out in this book, which is that regulatory in, instruments, including industrial policy, are doing most of the work of cutting emissions. And market systems, especially cap and trade systems, because the way cap and trade systems are designed, are in effect trading the residual that's left over. So regulation's doing almost all the work. What's being traded is a residual that's left over and the prices that are emerging from that market system that looks like a normal market system, but in fact, those prices are the residual prices and they don't reflect the real marginal cost of effort. So you're learning nothing useful from the cap and trade system in that, in that context and the cap and trade system itself is actually not doing very much work. We call them in the book, Potemkin markets. They're like those old czarist, uh, fabled czarist villages where you look at the facade it looks beautiful. It looks like a market-based system on a facade, but then you look behind and in fact, uh, nothing is going on. So our assessment throughout the book is that politicians were not asleep in economics 101. They were wide awake. They listened carefully. They took lots of notes. They were horrified by what they heard, not because they don't understand the beauty of the markets, but precisely because they understand that a lot of what we love about market instruments, their transparency, their fungibility, and so on, is, is a horror show for political leaders who are interested in politically survivable, politically durable policies, and that's the real work of politics. So I'm gonna hand the floor over to Danny now, who's gonna uh, draw out a couple of other implications from, from the, the study we've been doing. Thanks, David, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so we spend some time in the book from this building block, this foundational building block of what David's called, uh, what we call in the book, Potemkin Markets to try and think about how some of these political interactions between the policies tend to play out and the implications, not just for further understanding the dynamics of these systems, but how to think about reforms to market-based policies, as well as the appropriate balance between markets and non-market-based instruments, um, drawing on these fundamental insights. And I'm showing here a story about revenue use, which I think in our minds has become, I think probably the most central feature of these programs and also one of the most understudied. Um, one of the lines that we see right now in, in the academic literature in thinking about policy sequencing and political economy of climate policy is the discussion that success in regulation can beget success in coalitional politics to support carbon prices, and then success in carbon prices will support stronger regulations. Um, and in practice, we think we see a very different set of outcomes that need to be properly understood. Um, if you are a, a new uh, industry, a low carbon industry that's a new entrant that's relatively small, um, we rarely see examples of those industries focusing their lobbying and policy efforts on particularly multi-sector market-based programs, particularly because, as David suggested, um, trying to push a multi-sector program to a higher level of price or ambition is something that would benefit any low carbon uh, um, new entrant but it also requires essentially taking on all of the vested interests that are currently regulated under that program. Conversely, lobbying for support structures that are direct, that are regulatory in nature or have public expenditures can be much more narrowly targeted to the interests of that new entrant. And so we think we see in practice much more focus uh, on those issues, which is not to say that the, the politics of market-based climate policies have no relationship to strengthening the ambition of regulatory programs and broader coherent climate policies, quite the opposite. Um, the way we see that in practice, we believe comes much more through the revenue side of how revenue is collected either from auctioning allowances under cap and trade programs or from directly levying taxes under tax-based systems. And what we're showing here is a figure uh, that was produced uh, originally by a group of uh, researchers in Paris at the Institute for Climate Economics. Uh, it was eventually published under the cover of a World Bank technical note and it attempts to categorize all of the major revenue flows of all of the major tax and trading systems in the world, which uh, as of the 2018 data, which are the most uh, recent available, total somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 billion US dollars per year in revenue, which is in the grand scheme of the global economy, not a terribly large amount, but frankly, from the standpoint of explicit climate policy, a fairly large figure. Um, and a couple of striking items pop out to us. When we cut through some of the descriptions about how these funds are used, we see basically three different categories. Um, one is revenue that goes directly to a state's general fund, the notion that, that the money is just put directly into the government's central pot and the way that gets expended is the normal way that happens in a country. Um, a second flavor, which is very popular in US political discussions is this concept of revenue recycling, the idea that revenues would be transferred back to residents of a polity or used to reduce distortionary taxes. 
uh, in ways that could have economic gains overall. Um, but maybe the most striking piece of the puzzle from our point of view is this uh, category we call green spending, just spending that is nominally directed at further climate mitigation, uh, typically mitigation, occasionally adaptation. But the notion is that the money is spent on further emission reductions. Um, and we see that that dominates in the carbon markets category. The vast majority of revenues collected under these programs are earmarked in ways that are at least nominally directed towards climate spending. And I think if we want to get really serious about the politics of moving these instruments all together, connecting the dots between the revenue use and effective outcomes is going to be one of the most important pieces of the puzzle. It's also one that we think is, is radically understudied. There's precious little data about most of the major programs and how their funds are spent including in the European Union, where, again, there's been so much good work happening on the design and structure of the markets. There's almost no transparency on these global revenue systems, which we think are potentially some of the more important parts uh, of a reform-oriented trajectory. The next thing I want to talk about is, is, I think, unfortunately, somewhat of a challenging story. Uh, and the example of California, I think, illustrates a number of these dynamics altogether. This figure attempts to show a, a couple of different features of our political model uh, in, in ways that I, I hope will clarify some of the main insights from our argument. Um, starting on the left-hand side of the figure, you see the explicit price in the state's multi-sector cap and trade program, which covers around three quarters of the state's emissions. Um, next to that, we have a, an implicit shadow cost for our state renewable portfolio standard, which is an aggressive policy to procure renewables uh, on the California grid. Um, next to that, we have another regulatory measure called the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which is essentially a tradable permit system for transportation fuels. And you can see that these two regulatory measures trade at significantly higher costs, in the case of the Renewable Portfolio Standard, an implicit cost. But in the case of the Low Carbon Fuel Standard, which currently trades at, at, in the neighborhood of 200 US dollars per ton, it's an explicit market-based price in a single sector. Um, it's much higher, it's almost 10 times the price, or I guess a little bit more than 10 times the price of the explicit cap and trade program, in part because the consumer facing costs are a mere fraction of that total price. Next to those regulatory instruments, we have uh, a series of costs articulated in the state's official climate policy for how to get to an ambitious 2030 emissions target that roughly resembles the ambition of the European Union's target. And in that document, the policies that are considered range from having negative costs, those that are perceived to have total benefits exceeding their costs, to programs that cost up to $200 a ton. And again, the range of these policies that, that's in this planning document gives a sense of the extent to which the state is invested in a number of different efforts to cut climate pollution at something like 10 times the explicit price on carbon. Maybe the most, um, for me at least, troubling piece of the picture is the final piece on the right, which shows uh, a set of data that are frankly fairly obscure and very difficult to collect um, about the cost effectiveness of the green spending that's conducted under the cap and trade program. California appropriates something on the order of two to $3 billion a year um, from the cap and trade auctions from this multi-sector uh, cap and trade program. And the money that's been spent uh, is nominally all required to be spent on climate mitigation purposes. When you look at the, the funds that are actually being spent, the average cost effectiveness of the expenditures, which are frankly all self-reported and haven't ever been audited, clocks in at nearly $500 a ton. Now, some kinds of climate investments that the state is pursuing are what we call transformative investments that in their early stage often have prices in that neighborhood or higher and are very desirable investments from the standpoint of investing in public goods. But I promise you there's also a significant share of these funds that are spent on things that have no real connection to climate policy whatsoever. And again, the extent to which these revenues are used to build political coalitions and to invest in public goods, we think is maybe the most important feature of market-based climate policies. It's also been the most opaque and in our view understudied. Another important issue that we take on in the book, we talk about uh, links between markets and the outside world, both in the, in the form of direct market links between polities, um, but also in the form of offsets, which has frankly been the dominant mechanism by which different market-based policies have interacted with one another. And I'm showing here a figure that's recently come out from the University of Oxford, uh, where uh, the community there has talked about transitioning from today's status quo carbon crediting systems towards one that is focused on long-term permanent carbon removal with a view towards the carbon neutrality goals that some countries and companies are putting forward. 
Um, and I think one of the most fundamental things that needs to be talked about in the context of offsets, particularly now that there's a great demand for carbon offsets in the private sector, as again, many private actors, companies are making these long-term pledges. The vast majority of these industries, particularly in North America, were born out of public policy regimes, beginning with the clean development mechanism, and most notably now in California, which has a multi-billion dollar carbon offsets market. Um, and these offset markets, when you look at the political economy of how they're structured, they're set up to provide low cost ways of basically exiting the market-based program or reducing the compliance costs of these programs. And I'm sure to, to many of you all who've studied the, the experience of the European Union and the CDM program and many of its challenges, some of this might be familiar, but it, frankly, in the North American context, we did not learn any of these lessons. And it's been very interesting watching comparable offset systems get set up at large scale without any attention to quality or independent oversight. And now as we see this resurgence of private interest, um, much of the industry has been born out of a system where the demand for offsets comes from uh, a demand for quantity at the lowest possible price, where there is no serious political constituency for quality. And we think that's one of the major challenges that needs to be thought about in designing these systems. I'll wrap up here with um, four major insights from the book, uh, and then I look forward to addressing your questions uh, in conversation going forward here. So we have four major insights that we draw from this political economy model. I think all of them have an element of controversy, but all of them follow directly from the observations we've attempted to make in a systematic way. Um, so the first that I think maybe flies in the face of standard economic theory is that multi-sector economy-wide programs are ideal from the standpoint of low-cost mitigation. They're also the most challenging from the standpoint of managing the politics of all of the affected groups for cap and trade programs in particular, because the ambition of the least ambitious sector sets what's politically feasible for the linked market as a whole. Um, we believe that when uh, governments are, are gonna rely on carbon pricing strategies, that the politics of implementing stable carbon taxes is easier um, once one is able to implement anything at all than that of carbon markets, because the structural political advantages of strong regulations we believe is gonna to continue to set up market-based systems to be in supporting roles. And that makes it very difficult outside of a narrow range of institutional contexts to manage effective markets. I wanna pause here just really briefly. We talk extensively about the success of the European Union over the course of 10 or more years in developing the institutional capacity to do this. So by no means are we suggesting that this can't be done or that no one's doing it. But I think when one takes a, a very clear look at what's going on around the world, there are very few governments that have effectively figured out how to do that on the market side. We think that challenge is steeper on the market side. And so for somebody starting new or thinking about a fresh opportunity, I think that's an important insight to draw on. The third insight is that I think in general, when we look at the balance of market and non-market based instruments, we've severely overemphasized the role that carbon pricing is likely to play, particularly at the early stages of deep decarbonization in sectors where we don't necessarily have all of the technologies we need to make significant progress. And the fourth uh, insight comes from this work I mentioned on offsets, where again, if you think carefully about the role of offsets in the context of the political economy of a carbon pricing system, they're almost always used to water down the ambition of that system. That is not to say that the things we currently support with carbon offsets shouldn't be supported. And we talk at great length in the book about ways to transition those programs to public expenditure, expenditure programs that are based on larger shares of auctioning or greater incidence of carbon taxes that comes from being able to exclude offsets. And to the extent you're using offsets to manage costs and the politics of costs in a program, we recommend that be done directly rather than through an instrument whose political economy, again, structurally waters down the quality of these programs across the board. So uh, I think that's a good place to pause. Uh, and, and we, again, really appreciate the opportunity to share this with you all, particularly during a very strange time for us in the US. Uh, and I look forward to the conversation. All right, thanks a lot to uh, Daniel and David for a great presentation. I, th I think this will be of great interest to a lot of the people attending the webinar. Uh, and just to note that this is being recorded so you can also access it um, after we finish. Uh, I only have one question so far in the Q&A box uh, and I'll keep giving priority to those who type their questions. But we'll take those first uh, and then afterwards we'll, we'll um, have a system where we, where we can also answer, um, uh, ask questions uh, directly. So the written one is for my colleague Osman Trollwanger who asks, how far should frontrunners move beyond laggards in terms of climate policies or carbon pricing? 
what's the balance between being a showcase, inspiring others, and just being exploited when you regard a stable climate system as a global common good? What's the, the right balance between those two? He asks. Um, maybe I'll say a couple words about this, and then uh, I'm sure Danny, who sits on the oversight board of the California cap and trade system in California, like Norway is a pioneer. Um, what, first, I think it's important to understand what the pioneers are doing just conceptually, which is they're pushing the frontier if they're doing what pioneers do. And they're in effect running experiments. They're out there, they're testing things, they're figuring out what works. And, and so as leaders, that's an enormous contribution. If followers <clears throat> can learn what the leaders are doing and if the leaders help the followers um, and so on, because the more that the pioneers are pushing the frontier and, and not just lowering the cost of technologies, but showing how, how real world business models can operate with new technologies that have much lower emissions, that raises the odds that other places in the world um, uh, uh, do something similar. And that's the fundamental logic of the climate problem. It's a globally mixed pollutant. That doesn't mean it's a global prisoner's dilemma kind of collective action problem, but it means that the leadership that's being done by the pioneers needs to be, needs to inspire followership. So that's a kind of first comment about the, what I think conceptually is very important about the pioneers. I think the question gets directly to the challenge, the political challenge if you're a pioneer, which is you can be way out in front and look behind you and nobody's following. <laughs> And worse, it's really expensive. So it's harmful to your economy or harmful to you as a, uh, as a firm and so on. So I think what we've learned in the real world is the pioneers are willing to do quite a lot. So this idea that the whole planet has to have the same level of effort, which you know, has been kind of latent in some of the literature uh, in, in, this, in this area, I think that's not correct. It's very clear. Norway's doing a lot. Sweden's doing a lot. Uh, California is doing a lot. There are other places that are maybe 15% of global emissions, depending on how you count, that are, that, are doing a, that are doing a whole lot. My sense is that we're now kind of reaching the limits of that, of how far the pioneers are willing to go and bear costs themselves without something going on in other parts of the world. Uh, in the book, we spend a, some time talking about border carbon adjustments. They are very, very important for getting the politics right here so that the pioneers are not bearing undue costs by being pioneers and they can find, whether it's through a border adjustment or some other kind of government compensation mechanism, they can, they can keep themselves whole enough that they can afford to go off and, and be pioneers and potentially create new industries. I just want to kind of draw out one implication of that though, which is if you think we're living in a world or will be living in a world where market instruments are gonna do, be doing most of the work then the border adjustments are very easy to design because you just go look at the markets and you say, what's the price here? And what's the price in the, in the um, competing jurisdiction? And you adjust, you put the Delta as the border adjustment. If you're instead living in, the, living in a world where most of the policy work gets done by, by a suite of regulatory instruments that are interacting sometimes nicely, sometimes poorly with the market instruments, then figuring out the actual border adjustment is much harder, much, much harder to, if you're going to do this in a way that's consistent with WTO um, uh, practice. And, and I think we haven't really grappled with that issue because we're talk, starting to talk more and more about border adjustments, but there's essentially no place that's really seriously looked at how would we figure out using real prices of carbon and all the, and the practical effect of the uh, regulatory instruments, what the border adjustment would actually be. And, you know, there's a lot in climate politics that's hard. This is something that's hard that needs to get done if we're going to um, avoid the kind of um, uh, the adverse outcome, which would be the pioneers don't have a strong incentive to be able to be pioneers because the pioneers are driving the ship right now. I'll just add really briefly, I think that, you know, there's so much work to be done in experimenting with infrastructure and new technologies. And that really is a question of what pioneers do. Um, we've seen a lot, we talk a lot in the book about one of the stories people tell about climate leadership is the idea of linking market-based instruments together, which I can tell you, at least in North America, is basically all anyone talks about from the standpoint of climate leadership these days. And, and it's, a, it's a really challenging problem because when we look at market links, we actually end up in a situation where, uh, just to take, again, California as an example, if California wanted to increase its ambition, that's going to affect the province of Quebec with which we're linked. And I guarantee you that the politics of trying to navigate that between subnational governments that have no formal legal relationships or institutional capacities to manage cross-border impacts, that's a much more difficult problem. 
Um, and really, when we look at market links that are out there, we don't really see anything outside of the European Union that resembles a situation where you have leaders, um, including the periphery countries, Norway, you know, Germany, and you also have Poland. And frankly, the, the political interests of those governments radically different on climate at times. Um, we don't see that replicated in, in other market-based systems. And so it's, I think, an important uh, element of this question is to think about what policy tool you want to use for what sort of strategy. And to the extent leaders are going to be pushing forward on things, um, markets are a very challenging way to exercise that leadership because it, it basically exposes the leader to the politics of all of its linked partners and vice versa. And we think that's a recipe for stagnation outside of really specific institutional contexts where, again, like in Europe, it's been a long time to build this up. We don't see very many other places where that, those conditions are present. Thanks for a deep answer to that question. I have one more from um, Tadam Fan at Statistics Norway and Cicero. She writes, policy implications will depend on the political setting. First of all, trust, accountability, and commitment. Do you somehow correct for indicators of these features? And do you have a conclusion on how to strengthen trust and transparency? Um, That's a very astute question. So um, we wrote this book in part to lay out as simple a model of politics as possible and no simpler. And we leave others to tell us why we're wrong and <laughs> what other variables we should have included and so on. But what we wanted to do was lay out a framework for how to, what, one way to think about how politics interfaces with the design and execution of market-based instruments, think about that systematically. And so from our point of view, the two institutional attributes that seem to explain most of the variation are the adoption rules that I talked about. You know, what are the standards by which new policies get adopted, whether it's majoritarian or consensus and others. And that's something that maps kind of straight on to the world of comparative politics, comparative constitutional law and so on. And then administrative capacity in the, in the sense that of the capacity of government to hold the politics together by compensating potential losers who are well organized politically and, and so on. So, we make the case that, that those two variables explain a lot of what's going on. Um, I could see that the question of trust and confidence, and co confidence in government, which in our country right now is pretty low, um, I could see that that would correlate, but also be distinct from some of those, uh, those variables. And there are measures of that. Um, and so I think one of the things that would be very interesting would be for someone who's interested in comparative political economy to, to show how that could that could make the model uh, the, the model more, more more powerful, but I just want to pick up on the back part of the question, which I think the back part of the question about the uh, what to do about transparency is is really really important. One of the arguments we make in the in the book is, and Danny showed some slides about this, is about revenues. The revenues that come from um, that come from cap and from market based systems are potentially transformative. They're $45 billion a year right now and rising. And they're spent on a lot of different purposes. And that, that, that's totally understandable because the politics requires that. But the part of the revenues that are spent on deep decarbonization and transformational markets, that part is not subjected to the kind of transparency that you would normally expect in public finance. And it's kind of the wild west there. And so one of the practical implications from our study is that if you're in an NGO and you want to make carbon markets work better, you should be devoting a lot more attention to more discipline around how the money gets spent. I'll add briefly, we, we didn't specifically look at those variables for our core model as David suggested, but there may be some elements of the book that resonate from that perspective. We talk a lot about the sort of politics of transparency within these systems, where we think when people get stuck because of these challenging politics, you do see more opaque systems. And I would contrast, for example, as complex as the European Union system is, one can look up all of the precise technical details of how the market stability reserve operates. And there's clear public metrics for what's going on in the market. California is almost entirely opaque. Uh, the Northeastern states Reggie program, um, arguably even more transparent than some of the others. And these transparency uh, conditions we think are really a feature of whether or not these systems are designed to be um, robustly integrated with new partners or reflect a long history of institutional development, particularly in the case of Europe. So it's in there sort of implicitly, but not to the degree that it's controlled for as a variable. Uh, we have 
about six minutes remaining. I currently have um, three written, two written questions, and one will take orally. Um, I'll start with um, Christina Boyd, uh, University of Oslo Law. Uh, she says, um, do you foresee any particular challenges with integrating removals by negative emission technologies or other means into market schemes? You want to talk about that, Danny, I mean, other than $600 a ton? Uh, yeah, I think really quickly, in the North American context, one of the challenges is we're doing this almost exclusively through forest carbon offsets, and we're not actually doing it through removals. It's largely through avoided conversion calculations. Almost nobody understands this. Almost everybody involved in the markets has a financial conflict, and everything is deeply challenged because the price points are so low by design. So if we think about much more sophisticated and higher price negative emissions technologies, one of the big challenges is going to be how do you get that price point to compete in a market-based structure? Um, I'm personally a little skeptical, which is why I think the, the revenue side of these programs is the better place to look for transformative early investments and important long-term technological development. There, you don't have to worry about dollars per ton. You have to worry about a well-managed public program to allocate funds to a particular outcome. And I think that's a lot easier to, to echo something David said with respect to the Equinor project. It's very hard to do long-term infrastructure financed on the basis of a carbon price that could change. Um, and I think that's a, a key consideration we try and draw out of the study. Um, Erin Boason, University of Oslo and CISRO, asks how many countries and or US states were a part of your sample? We looked at the full universe of significant uh, market instruments, market systems, cap and trade and carbon taxes. Um, we looked at a few in greater depth, uh, California, the Reggie system, which is the Northeastern part of the United States that people often say mean things about, but in fact, is a great system. It does exactly what it's designed to do. It's not designed to, to cause a lot of transformation. It's designed to raise revenue and the revenues are then used for, for causing transformation and the EU ETS. Those three we look at in much more detail. Uh, but we've spent some time looking at the carbon tax systems in particular um, uh, because there are important examples of, of high ambition efforts. All, all, almost all the low ambition systems are cap and trade systems. Carbon tax systems are high ambition. Um, so I think all in we're looking at eight or 10 systems in some significant way. And just one last word briefly about uh, instrument choice and ambition. It's no accident that carbon tax systems are doing more work than cap and trade systems. Uh, in, in part because they are easier to design in a way so they play nice with regulation <clears throat> so that the marginal incentive to do something remains in a tax system uh, when it does when it when it when a cap and trade system is trading the residual as a Potemkin market and and one of the key policy implications of our work is we need to design these market systems so that they are more tax like even if they're cap and trade systems they have floors and ceilings collars if you like so that they behave in a more tax like way and that makes them more effective in, in interaction with other policy instruments and a big part in the Norwegian current policy debate whether or not it makes sense to have additional measures in the emissions trading sectors precisely of the reason for the reasons you you mentioned so we have two more questions and we'll just have enough time for them i think so Lars Gulbrandsen with the Nansen Institute asks have you identified key mechanisms for accelerating climate policies or ratcheting up through your studies? Yeah, so we, I think the, the main answer I would give you, Lars, and it's, it's nice to hear from you, we, we think the revenue is, is the real serious side of the story here. If you really wanna move either the market-based systems or the companion policies with markets as a driver for that, the revenue side is where we think a lot of the most important action is. And we spent a lot of time in the book talking about how to structure revenue appropriations processes that accommodate the politics and also prioritize public goods according to the shifting interests in the government that's that's considering this. Um, I'll mention we spent quite a bit of time we didn't in this talk, but talking about very specific reforms for both market-based, particularly market-based systems to make them work better. And we use the same political model we use to diagnose the problems to suggest families of responses, not super detailed answers as to exactly where to set the market stability reserve, but more categorically, why those sorts of quantity or price-based adjustments are important to addressing the politics of the constituencies that are blocking the situation, uh, according to our theoretical model. Then we'll have to take the final question before we close. So Anneliese Kerfert from DNV GL asks, as to your pioneer discussion and given your election results, which is still uncertain, do you see enough leaders among US pioneer states to make a difference for the future of US emissions and also to participate on the global arena? 
Yeah, so I mean, the US is not going to be Norway. <laughs> uh, but there's a lot going on in the United States. And this is one of these areas where the modeling to the analyst, analyst community could do a better job of building modeling tools that represent the kind of real world representation of policies inside countries as opposed to thinking about just economy-wide policies. Because if you thought about this, if you think about this from in terms of economic efficiency, the best thing for the United States to do is an economy-wide policy so that all sectors and, and you know, all states are involved. What you see in the real world is much more fragmentation. And I think actually that's good news because although it costs more compared to some imaginable or un unknown ideal, it's more credible because you've got half or so of the country doing things and doing actually quite a lot around climate change. And so even when the federal government comes and goes in terms of engagement with climate policy, the stuff at the state level and the local, local level is more baked in and more credible. And if you think about this as an international cooperation problem where people are looking to the United States and asking, is what the US says credible? This is one of the ways that you make your commitments more credible as you bake them into the heartland where they're harder to reverse. Whereas if you put them in Washington, where depending on who wins the White House, politics swings this way and swings that way, especially in the world of divided government, it's very hard to be credible. And in international cooperation, credible, credibility is, is essential. I'll add only briefly that I think a lot of the institutions and governments at the subnational level that have ambitions of acting like a country like Norway, the institutions are very flimsy and the capacity to meaningfully represent things I think is much weaker than many would like to see it. Even though I share David's view that there's actually a lot happening that's resilient to federal regime change, uh, particularly in the electricity sector right now, but also I'll flag for people. There are elements of the United States that are decarbonizing the building sector and, and thinking very carefully how to push natural gas systems out of an existing building stock. If we figure out how to do that well, um, that's, I think, an example of a profound leadership opportunity where it's not so much about the tons, but about the model that others would need to follow to take a similar action. At a quarter past, we have two more questions. But Eric, you're the boss. <laughs> Will we take two more minutes for those questions, or should we finish exactly on time? Uh, I think nobody has uh, asked for the word now. Uh, Ellen had two additional questions in the chat, not in the Q&A yeah. box. In the chat. Do you see them? Yes. Yeah, just David, go on. Danny, do you see that in the chat from Ellen? Did you take time into account? Do you examine whether it matters when in the climate transition process a carbon price is introduced? And yeah. how did you include a measure administrative capacity in the model? Uh, what was the effect of this? Uh, she didn't understand this in your model, if you might. Sure. Um, Danny, do you want to talk briefly about that? And then I'll talk about Sure. It. So we, we talked quite a bit as a, as a framing matter that you know, we think carbon pricing is very, very effective when there are existing commercial technologies that need to be selected. Uh, we, we talk about this as, as a kind of static optimization. So um, maybe the best example of this is the United Kingdom's use of a carbon price to help accelerate its transition off of coal and into natural gas in the power sector. Those are the kinds of short-term transitions where we think carbon prices are most effective. But when it comes to particularly first-of-a-kind infrastructure projects, and again, the Equinor project comes to mind as an example of this, um, we think that's where the prices are sort of weakest in their effect. And we see this actually even in California's uh, low carbon fuel standard program, which does trade at $200 a ton, and in theory is open to direct air capture and a variety of carbon capture and storage projects. It is very difficult to finance such a project, even at that price point, which should be sufficient according to technical studies, precisely because the credibility of the market and the long-term financeability of that policy signal is much weaker compared to traditional government regulatory incentives and mandates. Um, with respect to administrative capacity, I think the, the question is a little bit more complicated than we may have time for, but we talk a lot about the importance of the ability of the government to narrowly address a stakeholder's concerns. Um, the more uh, a, a government is able to surgically address a concern without harming the other pieces of the market or diluting the effects of the program as applied to other parties, the more successful they will be. The less uh, sophisticated they are in those dimensions, the more they rely on blunter exemptions. Um, that effectively reduce the impact of the market price on the covered sector and possibly on, on some of the other linked sectors. Yeah, let me just add briefly, um, one of the implications, so on the, on the market instruments, the implication of thinking about these as decent instruments to help static optimization is that they play a role later in the game, not in the beginning. 
Um, and if you believe that we're still in early in the stage, early stages in most of the technologies, IEA's ET, new recent ETP suggests three quarters of the technologies are not available at commercial scale, then really the, the big action is these sectoral policies. I, I think the question from Ellen about um, how to measure administrative capacity is very astute. Um, the, we think the most important administrative capacities are compensatory, the capacity to hold the politics together. And to the extent that that's what one believes, then our standard comparative politics measures of administrative capacity are going to be slightly off the mark and we ought to think about them differently. We've showed conceptually how to do that or we, we, one way that we think could, be, could, could, could do that in the book. But this is an area where the comparative politics community, if they want to really work on climate, this is an area where we think they could add just, just tremendous uh, value. Great. We're a bit over time, uh, but we have answered all the uh, written questions, so that's good. So again, thanks a lot to uh, David and Danny for presenting their uh, new book on making climate policy work. And I, I'm sure that when we share the link to the um, uh, recording of this seminar, we can also include uh, where you can um, buy that book. Okay, I think. Excellent. Thank you very much to you and Cicero for ha having us. Really appreciate it. Very good. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Cheers.